This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. America celebrated its 239th birthday, and David Madlin of the Center for American Progress reminds us that the United States was founded as a middle-class country. Bernie Sanders is pulling big crowds and wowing progressives, but political scientist John Halpin says that while progressivism is the defining element of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton still looks pretty solid. And Bill Press celebrates the 10th anniversary of his radio and TV show by talking with Senator Amy Klobuchar. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Author David Madlin has just written a book about the hollowing out of the middle class. Yet he reminds us that America was founded 239 years ago as a middle class country. And we say hello to David Madlin, director of the American Worker Project and the managing director of the economic policy team at American Progress. He's also the author of a new book, Hollowed Out, Why the Economy Doesn't Work Without a Strong Middle Class. David Madeline, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks very much for having me. Well, it's great to have you with us um, and great topic. Your book, uh, for starters, A Scathing Indictment of Trickle-Down Economics. Uh, so is it your argument that Reaganomics is the chief culprit in the hollowing out of the middle class? It's a big culprit. Um, you know, so the idea behind Reaganomics was really you uh, help th- those at the top, and that then eventually that'll benefit everyone else. And you help the, the top by cutting their taxes, reducing their regulations, and by uh, you know weakening things like the minimum wage and unions that would help ordinary workers. And the effects of that were are very clear in that incomes for most people have stagnated while the incomes at the top have grown very, very quickly. You can also really see this when you look at other countries, because some of the other explanations for why we have such high inequality are that you know globalization and uh, technology have changed, and those certainly have contributed to it, but not every country has had the record levels of inequality that we've had. Some, in fact, have been able to deliver economic growth for most of their uh, people. So you have you know, some examples, Canada or Australia, even Sweden, they've been able to have wage growth for most of their citizens for for decades, subject to the same economic forces that we've been subject to. Now, in the post-recession recovery, big economic numbers really do look good. But the reality is, individually, people are hurting. Is there or was there any way to avoid that? Well... First, I want to say, you know, the, the high-level numbers like the GDP, they're okay. They're, they're you know, they're, we're grow- the economy is growing. It's not growing super fast, but it's growing. Um, the real problem, though, is wages are not rising. We've had basically stagnant or even declining wages through, uh, through the Great Recession and, and the recovery. And what little growth there has been has gone almost exclusively to the very, very top. And so, yes, most people are hurting, but it's uh, what I think is really important to understand. It wasn't just the Great Recession. These are long-standing problems, and the Great Recession really brought them to the forefront. But since basically the 80s, uh, inequality has risen to extreme levels. Income gains have gone almost all to the top. It's not just about the Great Recession. It's a long-running trend. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you think the the Obama administration perhaps made a mistake in not pushing for stronger measures, or should this be handled, you know, at the state level, or is it just up to the private companies to to kind of take the lead, as some have, in terms well, of in terms of raising wages and that kind of thing to to close the gap a little bit? Yeah. So the, you know, as I said, this is a long running trend, and the administration did several good things to help us get out of the recession. You know, from the stimulus where money was put into things like infrastructure to other things where they've been trying to raise the minimum wage, for example, for government contractors, because that's what they can do because Congress won't let them raise the minimum wage for everyone. So the administration has definitely taken some steps. They could have, they could and should have done a little bit more. But the problems that we're talking about are longstanding, and any, pre, any single president 
in just you know their eight years could not have tackled them all. It's going to take a significant amount of time and a significant policy change. And that's really what I, I'm arguing in my book because for decades, our policies have been based on this idea of trickle down that if you make things better for those at the top, that's going to help everyone else. It's been a failure. And so we need to dramatically change the way we make policy to focus first on the middle class, to first improve their lot, and then that will benefit the rest of the economy. Obviously, there's going to be pushback on any sort of change that way, as there's been pushback for the last six, so going on seven years uh, with this particular administration. But as you point out, it, it is a longer term thing. What are some of those things? What is what's some of the groundwork that could be laid that's possibly bipartisan that would would actually achieve some some, some closer to equality in terms of wages and, and, and strengthening the middle class? Well, bipartisan is hard, as you know. The, sure. uh, but so on the bipartisan, and there are a few things. So our tax code is riddled with all sorts of loopholes that, for the most part, benefit the very wealthy and, and corporations. And there is some bipartisan willingness to tackle those loopholes. So that's the, the, one of the few places I see for bipartisan uh, agreement. The broader you know, the broader issue of things that need to be done right now, unfortunately, are not are typically opposed by Republicans. Things, for example, raising the minimum wage. We also really need to boost unionization. That has really been one of the key drivers of uh, the decline of the middle class has been that workers don't have any sort of power to negotiate with their employers. And so you can see that when you look across the world, countries that have stronger middle classes really have stronger unions, and sort of there's no doubt about that. So that's the kind of thing we need to do. It's a couple of big hills you just posed for. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, Republicans are going to fight that to the very end. Uh, it seems we're speaking with David Madlin, director of the American Worker Project and managing director of the economic policy team at American Progress. He's the author of a new book, Hollowed Out: Why the Economy Doesn't Work Without a Strong Middle Class. So, David, if, if you would, can you explain for, for us non-economists your principle that you need a strong middle class for the entire economy to work? I mean, how do you convince a Republican business owner of that? Well, I think one, you, you, you make the arguments about what a middle class does for the economy. And one of the first things and the easiest thing to understand is that business people – need consumers. In order for businesses to grow and thrive, they need consumers, and, and the consumers need to have money in their pockets. And with the middle class so weak right now, businesses don't really have enough customers. That's why we've had quite slow growth for a period of time. Um, also, you think of one of the major contributors to the Great Recession was that consumers went greater and greater into debt to just afford basics. They took on such high levels of debt that our economy became fragile and unstable. And so the weakness of the middle class contributed to the Great Recession, which collapsed profits for lots of companies and put lots under. So that's the kind of thing you, you, you need to – people need to understand and explain, and I go through that. But there's a lot more that the middle class – a strong middle class, a strong and growing middle class does besides consumption. They are also – help make our democracy work. So right now it's unfortunately that the rich have excessive power in our democracy, and so we do the things that benefit them instead of the things that would benefit all of the economy, like investing in infrastructure and investing in education. Because the wealthy, they, they just don't care about those things as much, and they don't want to pay the taxes to, to provide those kinds of things. But Everyone would be better off, and the economy would be growing more if we were able to make those kinds of investments, mm -hmm. and our democracy were functioning better. You also have uh, societies where there's a stronger middle class and lowers levels of inequality have uh, greater levels of trust between people. You're willing to do business with people. It's easier to do business. And instead, we now have a society characterized by high levels of distrust, and it, it makes businesses – transactions cost a lot more because you, for example, need more lawyers to do the kinds of transactions you used to not need them. You used to be able to do on trust. And so the share of lawyers in our economy has doubled over recent decades. Just you know, another example of the kind of costs we're all paying for higher levels of inequality. Now, you're calling for academics to totally rethink their view of the economy, to make it more interdisciplinary. What do you have in mind? Well, for years economists had this very narrow view of how human beings 
acted, that they acted just on their self-interest. And if you made them, give them a little bit more incentive, they were going to work harder and, and get rich. And there is some truth to that, but it ignores a much larger uh, system that's going on and that structures our economy. And so igno- economists, in, they had that really narrow worldview. What they were missing was that the economy is part of and structured in society and that it needs lots of different things in order to work properly. So one of the things it needs is a functioning government that's providing fair and adequate rules and making the investments in the public goods like education and infrastructure that I was talking about earlier. You also need to have um, you know, a trusting economy. If, if you think of m- many countries that, that are really not able to grow, they just there's such high levels of, of distrust. They, the economy doesn't work right, and so you need those kind of things that are just outside of these really little narrow way that the economists were thinking about the world. And they are coming to understand this. And there's been really great criticism within, even from sort of some of the most prominent economists. Tons of Nobel Prize winners have written scathing indictments similar to what, what I'm arguing. And so the, I think the, much of the uh, academic discipline of, uh, has coming around to this view that they've been overly narrow in how they think about the economy. Why did the scholars and the professional economists get it so wrong about trickle-down theory? There were a bunch of reasons, I think. Um, one, it, and the biggest, is that I just sort of talked about, is that they had this narrow view that made them unable to see the larger forces that were crumbling around them. So they could do these little, you know, and they would create these mathematical models that would say, yes, if you do X or Y, you're going to get this little increase and ignore that the foundations of the economy were crumbling because inequality had reached such record levels. The other thing is that there was, of course, a lot of political pressure and forces and advantage to be championing this kind of argument, to be saying that, oh, helping the rich makes everyone better. And so there was a lot of incentive for people to think a certain way. But I think the facts have become so clear that, you know, the facts ultimately are trumping all these other interests and, and ideologies. We had, we suffered through a great recession, and that really forced people's eyes wide open to say, wow, this, these old theories that we were relying on were totally wrong. David Madlin, director of the American Worker Project and managing director of the economic policy team at American Progress. His new book, Hollowed Out, Why the Economy Doesn't Work Without a Strong Middle Class. David, thank you so much for your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. My pleasure. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. How inevitable is Hillary Clinton? John Halpin of the Center for American Progress says there is ideological jostling to come and that the primary campaign will help the former Secretary of State define her platform. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Until 2010, CBS Television's daytime lineup included a long-running soap opera titled As the World Turns. But times change, and now a real-life human drama of profound importance has debuted in America titled As the Generations Turn. It's the inspiring story of our society's continuing struggle to evolve toward equality, dignity, and mutual respect, as well as love for all. The moment came on June 26, when Justice Anthony Kennedy proclaimed from the ornate chamber of the Supreme Court, The right to marry is a fundamental right inherent in the liberty of the person and under the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses of the 14th Amendment, couples of the same sex may not be deprived of that right and that liberty. Kennedy and four other justices voted to make this higher level of inclusiveness the law of the land. 
but they are not the ones who produce this landmark. Indeed, while the court's ruling debuts a new day, it is the culmination of generations of painful struggle by brave gay and lesbian activists and advocates. And in particular, it's the product of a defiant and determined LGBT movement for equality that arose from the brutal police riot at the Stonewall Club in New York in 1969. This democratic evolution from rank inequality literally came out of America's closet, rising through only a few neighborhoods at first, but then entering the consciousness of today's youth, rejecting the shibboleths, ignorance, fears, and bigotry that has previously permitted such intolerable discrimination. Young people have, in a remarkably short time, created a generational shift in the nation's consciousness. This is Jim Hightower saying, The true Supremes are the people themselves, and it's their awakening enlightenment that has transformed marriage equality from yesterday's taboo to today's affirmation of simple justice. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Political scientist John Halpin says that while Bernie Sanders is wowing the masses and that while progressivism is the defining element of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton remains a pretty solid favorite to win the presidential nomination. And we say hello to John Halpin, senior fellow at American Progress, focusing on political theory, communications, and public opinion analysis. John, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Nice to have you with us. Um, you know, although it may appear that Hillary Clinton is likely to be the Democratic nominee for president next year, you say that there's plenty of ideological jostling to come within the parties. What do you mean by that? Well, given that there there isn't any serious opposition to a Clinton candidacy at this point, the real challenge within the party will be to define what the Clinton agenda and message really is. And that's where I think various elements of the Democratic Party and the progressive movement can have a lot of impact. Um, I don't think you have to have somebody running against a person in order to influence that debate. You can say, you know, issues around inequality and trade matter a lot to us, and this motivates us, and we need you to pay attention to this. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that outside groups and factions within the party, uh, a lot of things they can do to influence the overall direction of what a, a Democratic presidential campaign will look like. Um, so I think there will be some some movement around that, you know, particularly over the course of the of the next few months. Uh, to sort of define what the central theme is. Is it going to be about the economic standing of middle and working families? Uh, you know, how hard are we going to take a stand against uh, financial abuses and things like that? I think these are things that there's that are uncertain yet, and I think there'll be a lot of pressure, you know, good pressure within in the party to try and define these things in the most progressive way possible, uh, in the most progressive. Uh, you know, with the most progressive ideas that can actually win a general election. So I, th I think that 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 jostling will be good ultimately. Is she inevitable, Hillary? Uh, in in the primary or the general or both? Yeah, both. Yeah, I mean both. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, nobody, nothing's inevitable. Obviously, that's what people thought in '08, and you know, Obama came from nowhere. The and and he became a very strong candidate, historic candidate. Doesn't appear to be any evidence of that occurring right now. I don't think the people who are talking about uh, taking her on, whether um, you know it's Bernie Sanders or Martin O'Malley, are in the same position as Obama was, because Obama represented something historical in nature, and I think he really drove a lot of young people to, su to support him. I don't see that happening, so uh, it's not inevitable, but it, it looks pretty solid there. The general is definitely not inevitable. I mean. Um, right. The polling's the polling's pretty split at this point. There's no reason why, uh, you know, a fairly non-rabid, non-ideological centrist Republican couldn't win the presidency. I mean, it, you know, people people lose interest in parties after eight years, regardless of 
whatever good you've done. It's just an, it's just sort of the ebb and flow of politics. The Democrats have been in power and the presidency for a long time, and so they they can't uh, be complacent because people want to change after a while. It's just pretty natural. So I think at, in the general, she's not at all inevitable, and that will be a heck of a fight. But I, I think in the primary, barring some change that we're not seeing right now, it looks pretty clear that if should she decide to run, she will be the candidate and will get a lot of support. Mm-hmm. Again, we're speaking with John Halpin, senior fellow at American Progress. Um, surprisingly, it, I think it, you make the claim that progressivism is the defining force within the Democratic Party and possibly among the American people as a whole. What's your evidence for that? If you remember in the 1990s, there were a lot of ideological fights between uh, then President Clinton and other elements of the more traditional liberal establishment in the in the party uh, over the role of government, over regulatory policy, over finance, things of that nature. Most of that changed after the Bush years and after the financial collapse. Um, some of the most centrist, you know, economists in the in the party have come around to mass investment and education and things that would bolster the middle class. Almost everyone takes issues of inequality quite seriously and spends a lot of time trying to figure out in policy terms how to deal with that on social issues, uh, the sort of cultural world battles that used to divide the Democrats. Those have basically been resolved in a much more tolerant and inclusive manner. Um, so all the debates that used to divide people, uh, it's not that there aren't debates anymore, but they, the big ones have been resolved in a more progressive position. It doesn't mean at any given time you'll get the most populist or progressive uh, position on, on any given issue. But in general, the direction of the party since the mid-90s has changed dramatically in a, a more left-leaning direction. What are the causes or, or the manifestations of that movement to the left? Uh, a couple of reasons. I think part of it is a reaction to to the sort of radicalization of the Bush years. Um, I mean, that I think Democrats recognize that trying to have accommodation with a radical right governing agenda is not going to work. And you could see what happens when you – you know, you tried to capitulate on the war in Iraq. You tried to give in a little bit on tax cuts here and uh, deregulation. It, you know, it, it led to a, a multitude of disasters in terms of foreign policy and domestic policy that Democrats were not going to do again. So I think that's part of it. The other, the other one is the change uh, in the voting base of, of uh, the U.S. electorate. So. You know, my colleague Rudy Teixeira and I have written a lot about this, about the the rapid diversification of the of the U.S. electorate. It's pretty pretty well established fact now, but it's had a profound impact in changing uh, the ideological tenor of the Democratic Party, which has benefited from uh, this sort of big tent ideological movement. And so, I, I, so it's a mix of it's a reaction to actual events from the Bush administration to the financial collapse. Um, which discredited uh, certain policies that are more geared towards the pro-business side, added to a new pool of voters who, by definition, have come of age at a different time uh, and have different views about government and are more tolerant and diverse on social issues. Kind of reactionary to Tea Party uh, activity? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think the... It's only strengthened with all the Tea Party opposition to to the president. I mean, mm-hmm. people, Democrats are very angry about that. They find it not only disrespectful and um, you know out in left field in many ways, but but uh, harmful to the country and something that has to be challenged in a very forceful manner. Um, you know, I don't think there. People talk a lot about whether there should be a Tea Party to the left. I don't think so. I mean, I think I think most of the strong mainstream progressive populist ideas and the Democratic Party enjoy majority support within the country, uh, whether it's on investment in education, jobs, wages, uh, climate change, um, social issues around gay marriage, other things. I think that, you know, the center of the of the Democratic Party's agenda is much closer to where the center of the country is. And so um, they should continue to push that because it's what voters want and fight against the reactionary right without I think, in my in my mind, sort of diverging off into ideological disputes that only strengthen the right. Yeah. Do you think that the populist views that so many Democrats hold are also held by wor- white working class voters? And, and if so, why don't they vote that way? It's an excellent question. And, and there's no, it, 
all the evidence suggests that they are far more populist on most of the things around Wall Street reform, um, uh, you know, around wages, around investment in jobs, around trade. I mean, they're almost pretty radicalized in, in economic terms in some ways. But I think it's a, it's a long-term identity issue. I, I don't think there's been a huge amount of outreach to the white working class since the mid eight, mid 80s, maybe you know early 90s. All of the the institutional presence among some of these communities has started to erode outside of labor unions, which themselves are facing historic troubles. Um, some of it has to do with the concentration of the white working class vote in the South, which has historic differences socially, politically, culturally, uh, but those challenges still are present in the upper Midwest as well. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's difficult um, to, to, to understand why people who hold such radical economic views are not voting for Democrats, and it may just be there's some cultural gulfs, some differences. You know, I think this issue um, of quasi – by coastal elitism in the Democratic Party is probably real. Um, there's a sense that in some ways they've been left behind by by the party, and it, it makes no sense. I mean, there should be aggressive outreach on economic populist grounds, culturally sensitive to the white working class communities, and they sh we should have, you know, a real rainbow coalition that's class based, uh, that's fighting for working families. I mean, that that's a winning formula for Democrats. Now, whether it's Hillary Clinton or someone else is the party nominee, how do Democrats win over the white working class voters who for so many decades benefited from progressive policies, policies and, and government activism? Yeah, I think you have to take it you know, step by step. And one way would be to say, well, who, who, are, who are Democrats most likely to reach in the near term, meaning the next two to five years, and over what issues? And I think it's pretty clear that you're going to reach younger uh, white working class voters more easily, and you're likely to 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 reach um, women in the in the white working class. And so I think an agenda around equal pay, paid sick days, paid family leave, child care support. I mean, these are core, you know, core economic issues for for uh, for these voters. And it should be a, you know a tremendous part a tremendous part of our outreach to them. Um, I think you know you're not going to get all of these voters, but you could get enough to offset some losses in other places. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think you just you, you take it step by step, and that would be one way, which is what do these voters really need? What do they want? Say we hear you, we understand that we've crafted an agenda that's going to going to meet these needs, and we want you to be part of this. We you know we we have an open party, and we have a role for you. You know, it's not just people that you think are different than you. Uh, we're all united on a, on class grounds and trying to shift the country back towards the middle class and the, and the working class. I think that's one way to do it. And, and, it, and it takes time. You probably have to do it by region and state as well. I think you know the project in the South probably takes longer, but it's you know there are pockets of of white working class populism all over the South, and you know it's harder to move state legislatures there and things like that. You get all this crazy gerrymandering and you know, um, abuse of power by the right. But you can do things at a national level and, and you can try out this agenda and see if it works. And I think Secretary Clinton would be in a good position to try that, uh, as good a position as anybody else. And soon enough, we shall see. John Halpin, Senior Fellow at American Progress, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. John, thanks again so much for joining us today. We look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Take care. And the, this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his 10th anniversary program guest, Senator Amy Klobuchar. We certainly welcome one of my favorite United States senators, one of my favorite people, Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. Hi, Senator. How are you? Well, hey, Bill. Uh, congratulations. Happy anniversary. Ten years. That's amazing. So I suppose you've been telling everyone who was your favorite interview. Uh, yes, and I've been telling everybody it was you. Oh, there you go. Well, I just thought that would be a good way to begin. Anyway, happy now, I heard someone asking about state fair food. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was just going to say, now that we've got you, Peter was just about to do a little story on Minnesota State Fair foods. They announced the, the, the newest foods in 2015 that you can get at the Minnesota State Fair, which I've been to and is amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, they have a mac and cheese cupcake. Uh huh. They have a Snicker bar salad, which is Snickers, Granny Smith apples, oh vanilla pudding, whipped cream, God. and caramel sauce. Uh-huh. <laughs> they have, no, uh huh. They have. They have tachos, which are which are nachos, but they're made with tater tots. Mm-hmm. And they have deep fried ribs. Okay, so what you need to know is that I have a booth at the State Fair. Oh, you do. And I go every single year, and I actually am there. At 6 a.m., oh, uh, wow. when gates open the first day, and then I try various foods on TV that are these new foods. So you've given me a preview oh, because dear. all the vendors come, and the only thing I wouldn't eat was the fried lamb testicles. Oh, <laughs> that one year. okay, but good that move. Was a box request. I didn't do that. Um, but they have. They're actually the most famous thing at the state for in addition to all the food. Um, and where my booth is, which is by this uh, Bob's Snake Zoo, is actually uh, the carving of the Princess K the Milky Way out of butter buff. Yes. This woman sits in a revolving refrigerator, and thousands of people watch, and she carves the faces of the Princess K and the Milky Way each way a diff- each day a different one. Everyone's wearing down jackets. And oh then their, the butter bus are displayed. And I once asked the princesses what they do with their butter bus <laughs> when the fair is over. And, they, and most of them take it home, put it in their mom's freezer. And these things are huge. And then they say it degrades over time. So they usually take it out for the town corn feed. Oh. And then they just dig in. <laughs> oh, no. But that's a really good one. So, but we would like you to visit. I, both I, of you. I, boy, I didn't realize the things were so exciting in Minnesota. It's Pretty quite a time at the fair. I'm telling at the you. state fair. It's, it's pretty quite good. A time. It is the biggest state fair uh, in the country. Uh, we don't count Texas because it's open for a month, but in Texas, they count Texas. So uh, yeah. they are maybe they're bigger, but they're open for a whole month. So. Yeah. Well, what a great day for you to come uh, come on board here! It's just yeah. in time to give us a, the full report on the Minnesota State Fair yes. foods. Thank you. If I dare ask you about another <laughs> uh, another topic, uh, President mm-hmm. Obama making a pretty historic announcement yesterday uh, in the Rose Garden regarding uh, opening of the U.S. Uh, embassy reopening, I guess, in Havana. W- what's significant about that? Why is that so important, Senator? Well, it is actually an incredibly positive first step. Uh, I'm carrying the bill to lift the embargo, which is a bipartisan bill and includes uh, Republicans like Mike Enzi and Jeff Flake and as well as a lot of Democrats, including Patrick Leahy and Dick Durbin and others. And um, basically, in order to lift the embargo, I mean, you really do need to have embassies first. And uh, this embassy, which has been called for a long time an interest section uh, does have personnel in it now it's sitting there right in the middle of Havana and so in the case of the U.S. I just think it's really important if we want to turn back the history of this 54 year old now we've learned uh, policy that really hasn't produced the kind of results we'd like to see uh, we have to start somewhere and the place to start is with an embassy yeah and uh, I was just down in Cuba last month I mean uh, well, in, in May, actually. It's a beautiful... It's, we're not starting from scratch, right? We have a beautiful building in Havana. As you point out, it's right on the Malecon. It's a beautiful, beautiful location, a big building, fully staffed. And then the Cubans have... It's called an intersection, but they have a large delegation here in Washington, D.C. as well. So uh, it's... Um, you know, since we have them there, like, why not, right, make them official embassies? Do you think... Mm-hmm. Do you think... Um, Secretary of State John Kerry may make the visit himself? Well, that is the plan, that he would be there to hoist the flag and Mm. open the embassy, um, and that it would be sometime uh, in July. Uh, Under the law, the the administration has to give Congress 15 days' notice. And as you point out, because we already have a building and its staff, there's not really the kind of budget um, antics that could be played here um, to try to stop this from happening. But I do think that there'll be some opposition, and I know we've already heard some people express that. We know that, but what I've seen being up here in Roseau, Minnesota, 12 miles from the Canadian border today, uh, in northern Minnesota, is that 
there's just not a lot of opposition to this. People see this as an opportunity, not just for the Cuban people, but also for our own country in terms of exports and American goods. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there are businessmen and business leaders and farmers, uh, particularly in, in Minnesota as well as every state, who see an opportunity. As you point out, th- there are some real good business opportunities here just 90 miles from our shore that they've not been able to take advantage of. Yeah, it's 11 million people, 90 miles off our shore, not to mention the potential with other countries, um, Latin American countries, who have long been opposed to our policy with Cuba. Um, it also arguably, if according to people I've talked to, I could help with those relationships as well. And this is something Minnesota alone is already doing 20 million in agriculture exports uh, purchases because of the humanitarian exemption uh, with Cuba because they mm. don't have enough food. Yeah. Uh, when I was there with Senator McCaskill and Warner, we actually visited the Newport Muriel uh, that is being constructed just for the purpose of receiving exports. Yes. And, um, right. that, the Port of Havana that you probably saw will mm-hmm. be the tourist port now. Right, yeah. Uh, we so we drove are, by that. We drove by that uh, uh, Marial Port, which they're building. Mm-hmm. Which they're building there. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, there are tremendous op- opportunities there. You know, you mentioned a little opposition, Senator. I I can't quite figure this out, but uh, your colleague, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, yesterday called the fact that we're opening an embassy a slap in the face to Israel. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, uh, un- yeah, you would. I think you'd have to have him on your show uh, to ask <laughs> about that, and that would be a very special way to celebrate your 10-year anniversary. <laughs> um, but right. so I'm not going to try to figure that out. I did visit with the Jewish community when I was in Havana, um, and clearly they have been very involved in human rights issues. That's how the Catholic community, and as mm-hmm. we know, the Pope is uh, visiting there, and there still continues to be um, uh, many human rights concerns there, as there are in other countries uh, that we have uh, do business with. But right. m- my feeling is that we have waited so long, and that hasn't changed uh, under the current government, under the current situation and laws, and that opening things up and working with them and gradually uh, adding back trade and travel uh, can only be of help here. And so uh, there's clearly been human rights concerns, and I'm hoping the Pope addresses those as well when he goes. I, I bet I, I think we can count on him to do so. Senator Amy Klobuchar, our guest here on the Bill Press Show, this uh, celebratory anniversary show. Senator, the, the embargo, though, that's the big deal. That is, that's really going to make the difference. And you're carrying that legislation. I know there's a lot of opposition there, particularly for, among Republicans in the Senate. How do you see your chances realistically? Do you think we can get that through? Well, first of all, I have not only do I have Republicans on the bill, I have a number of them uh, that are still looking at co-sponsoring, and a number of said they would vote for it, um, even if they're not co-sponsoring it. So actually, we have 17 co-sponsors. We've been adding um, every week, uh, and um, I have at least, I think, about 15 people that are looking at it now very seriously. Uh, There is a second bill that Senator Flake is leading uh, with Senator Leahy that I'm also on Mm -hmm. that would just simply lift the travel embargo. Yes. As you know, to go there like you did, you have to yeah. be part of some kind of group. Right. Uh, yet there are commercial flights going back and forth for those groups all the time. And I really originally thought, well, you could just do the travel embargo with that and wait a while and, you know, wait a year, wait two years. But the problem with that, as you visited there, is that there's going to start to be a lot of repairs and upgrading of restaurants and new hotels and things. And if we have all these American tourists going there, but we can't have American exports and American Mm -hmm. goods go to help them, they're going to be sleeping in Spanish financed hotels and eating German and Chinese food uh, because they don't have embargo. So I just think the uh, combination of the potential for the Cuban people with this investment um, and then also the uh, leverage we could have in terms of going in there, I think it's really important that we also lift this embargo. It's unbelievable the rules in place right now. If a ship uh, goes over to Cuba, it can't go back to America for 180 days. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and so that our bill yeah. changes that, it, it makes it so that you don't have to get a special license for every product, which you don't have to do in other countries. Um, and it just makes it easier to do business in terms of not having to have cash advances that you could have credit mm-hmm. advances like you do with every other country. So there are these uh, rules in place that were clearly 
put in place to make it impossible to do business. And so while it is going to be really important to lift that travel ban for Americans, people right. have to see it's equally important, especially for parts of the country like mine that see this potential of exports and to get those kinds of votes from senators or Republicans in the Midwest, I think it's really, really important to also do something about uh, the travel ban. Absolutely. Uh, the, yeah. export, the export uh, ban. Uh, right. Export and travel ban. As President Obama said, making the argument, I thought, as strongly as he could, that, you know, we've been doing it the other way for 54 years and it hasn't worked. So time to yeah. try something new. Senator Amy Klobuchar, yeah. way out. No, we're not on. saying that about your show, though, today. No. <laughs> no that's good. <laughs> I mean, there are exceptions to that general, that general <laughs> All theory. Right. All right. I just well, one other thing about Cuba I want to say is when I went there, everywhere you looked on artwork was the date, December 17th. And yes. I thought, what's that? Some old thing? And, and, and that, for most Americans, it means nothing. For them, that, that was the day President right. Obama said he wanted to open relations. Uh, uh, um, we we, we uh, experienced the same thing. It's like they're July 4th now, really. Right. So, mm-hmm. so good of you to join us today, Senator. Thanks so much. Thank Enjoy you your so. time uh, in your home state there. And we'll see you at the state fair. Okay, very good. We'll All see right. you there. You made a commitment to come. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Amy Klobuchar, I love to go out there for that, actually. She's just she's just great. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. David Madlin, John Halpin, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate. Donate.